May 8, 1982. South Atlantic, 51 degrees south, 58 degrees west. The freezing wind cut across the deck of HMS Hermes as the carrier steamed into the teeth of the southern winter. The sea was steel gray, laced with streaks of foam, and visibility shifted minute by minute as low clouds swept across the task force. Below the flight deck, every corridor echoed with the deep mechanical hum of a ship preparing for combat. For the first time since the Second World War, the Royal Navy was entering a major air war far from home, and the aircraft lined up on the deck hardly looked like the tools of a modern conflict. The Harrier had been laughed at for years, a subsonic jump jet in a supersonic age. Too small, too slow, too lightly armed, and famously derided in NATO circles as an experimental sideshow rather than a frontline fighter. Analysts in multiple countries argued that any serious air force would swat it aside long before it could deliver a meaningful blow. Even within Britain, some questioned whether a vertical takeoff aircraft could survive in modern air combat. The U.S. Navy had dismissed the concept entirely. The Soviets believed the aircraft's lack of speed made it irrelevant in real air-to-air -air engagements. But on that cold morning in the South Atlantic, as flight deck crews pulled off tie-downs and signaled for startup procedures, the Royal Navy was about to test whether those criticisms were true or whether they had misunderstood the aircraft entirely. Inside the carrier's combat information center, radar operators watched the screens carefully. The first Argentine probes had already taken place. High-speed contacts, a four Skyhawks, Mirage 3s, daggers fast and numerous, pushing toward the British ships operating near the Falklands. If these aircraft broke through, they would find lightly defended transports, troop carriers, and supply ships. The early hours of the campaign would test one simple question. Could the Harrier protect an entire task force on its own? As the first Sea Harrier rolled toward the ski jump, its engine tone rising into a sharp metallic roar, the world was about to discover that the aircraft so many had dismissed as outdated possessed capabilities no supersonic jet could replicate at such close quarters. And to understand why, one must first examine how the Harrier had gained its unlikely reputation long before it entered the South Atlantic. To understand why so many analysts dismissed the Harrier before the Falklands, one must look back to the aircraft's origins. The concept behind it emerged in the late 1950s, at a time when the world's major air forces were pursuing ever faster fighters capable of Mach 2 flight. Britain, however, was exploring a far more unconventional path, a vertical slash short takeoff and landing aircraft built around the revolutionary Pegasus engine and vectored thrust nozzles. The early prototypes, the P.1127 and later the Kestrel, were remarkable engineering achievements, but they were also slow, limited in payload, and carried no radar. They were seen as fascinating demonstrators rather than serious combat machines. When the Harrier entered service in the late 1960s, these perceptions hardened. It remained a subsonic aircraft in an era dominated by fast jet interceptors. Its range was modest, its weapon load relatively light, and its systems were far more basic than the radar-equipped fighters being deployed by the United States, the Soviet Union, and France. Many in the U.S. Navy argued that an aircraft unable to outrun or outclimb its opponents would have no chance in modern air combat. Soviet assessments were similar, focusing on the Harrier's lack of speed and its vulnerability to beyond visual range threats. Even within NATO, the jet was often regarded as a niche platform, useful for close air support perhaps, but unsuited for air superiority. Much of this criticism stemmed from misunderstanding Britain's doctrinal approach. While others pursued speed, Britain pursued flexibility. The Harrier was not designed to win dogfights through raw velocity, but to operate from improvised locations, short runways, roads, forest clearings, or forward bases that would be impossible for conventional jets. In a European war, this meant RAF Harriers could disperse from vulnerable airfields and continue fighting even after enemy missile strikes. The aircraft's ability to take off with a short rolling run and later, using a ski jump, allowed Britain to field fighters from small carriers the world had written off as obsolete. Yet these advantages were theoretical until 1982. The Falklands would become the first conflict in history where a subsonic V stole fighter faced modern supersonic opponents, and where the assumptions of decades would be tested in the harshest possible environment. When the British task force entered the South Atlantic, it faced an opponent far more formidable than many outside South America realized. 
Argentina's air arms split between the Air Force, FAA, and the Navy cone, possessed nearly 200 combat aircraft capable of striking the British fleet. In raw numbers, they held an overwhelming advantage, and the types they fielded were fast, aggressive, and, in several cases, equipped with modern weapons that no subsonic fighter should have been expected to counter easily. The backbone of Argentina's strike capability rested on the A-4 Skyhawk. Though American-built in the 1960s, the A-4 was fast, agile at low level, and easily capable of delivering conventional bombs with deadly accuracy. Operating at wavetop height, Argentine pilots regularly used the island's terrain to mask their approach, appearing only in the final seconds before releasing their ordnance. In the narrow waters of Falkland Sound and San Carlos Water, these low-flying Skyhawks posed a lethal challenge. Complementing them were the Israeli-built Daggers, export variants of the Mirage 5, capable of supersonic speed and quick-hit attack runs. They were fast, hard to intercept, and flown by pilots accustomed to operating over long distances with minimal navigation aids. Though lacking air-to-air -air refueling, they could still reach the British task force with careful fuel management and aggressive low-altitude routing. Their speed made them particularly dangerous opponents for the subsonic sea harriers. Even more concerning was Argentina's naval aviation component. The Dassault-built super attendards, paired with the French-made AM-39 Exocet anti-ship missile, represented a capability Britain could not afford to underestimate. The threat of a single Exocet was enough to force the Royal Navy into constant defensive maneuvers. Two missiles sank HMS Sheffield and later struck the Atlantic conveyor. Only five missiles existed in Argentina's inventory, but each had the potential to alter the course of the conflict. Facing this mix of low-level Skyhawks, supersonic daggers, and missile-armed attendards, Britain confronted a severe asymmetry. The Argentine Air Force fought from land bases close to the islands. Britain's Sea Harriers, by contrast, operated from small carriers thousands of miles from home, with limited numbers, limited deck space, and no ability to surge reinforcements quickly. This imbalance framed the central question of the air war. Could a small group of subsonic British fighters withstand repeated attacks from a numerically superior, faster, and geographically advantaged opponent? The transformation of the Falklands air war began with a set of capabilities few outside the Royal Navy had appreciated before 1982. While the Harrier family was often mocked for its lack of speed, the Sea Harrier FRS.1 carried a combination of systems and tactics that, when used together, reshaped the balance entirely. This shift did not occur through one silver bullet technology, but through the fusion of engineering design, pilot training, and innovative doctrine. The first component was the Blue Fox radar. Although modest by contemporary standards, it offered something the Argentine attackers lacked. The ability to search over water at low level, distinguish aircraft from sea clutter, and guide sea harriers onto incoming raids with precision. Argentine pilots relied heavily on visual detection, often limited by poor weather, sea spray, and the need to fly extremely low to avoid British ships' radar. The Sea Harrier, with Blue Fox, could position itself advantageously before the enemy even knew it was there. The second advantage lay in the aircraft's unique vectored thrust maneuvering capability, often referred to as viffing. By adjusting the Pegasus engine nozzles in midair, Sea Harrier pilots could change their velocity in ways no conventional aircraft could match. This allowed for rapid deceleration, sudden nose-pointing authority, and tighter turning circles at low speed. In the dense, twisting engagements over the Falklands, where most fights occurred below 10,000 feet, this agility proved decisive. Argentine daggers and mirages, optimized for high-altitude, high-speed flight, were often forced into energy states where the Sea Harrier enjoyed the advantage. The third component, and arguably the most consequential, was the AIM-9L Sidewinder. This all-aspect missile allowed British pilots to engage targets from angles previously impossible. Earlier Sidewinder variants required a rear-aspect lock, meaning the attacker had to position itself behind the enemy aircraft. The AIM-9L, however, could lock onto heat signatures from almost any direction, even head-on. Argentine pilots, unaware of this shift in capability, often broke into maneuvers that would have defeated earlier sidewinders but were ineffective against the new model. Supporting all of this was rigorous British pilot training. Royal Navy and RAF pilots were accustomed to operating in poor visibility, rough seas, 
and unpredictable weather, conditions that mirrored the South Atlantic. Their discipline in maintaining combat air patrols, fuel management, and radar vectoring played a crucial role in every engagement. Combined, these elements produced a kill ratio that stunned observers worldwide. But the true test of this capability emerged during the intense battles that followed, especially over the narrow waters of San Carlos. The decisive phase of the Falklands Air War came with the British landings at San Carlos on May 21, 1982. The sheltered inlet offered natural protection for unloading troops and equipment, but its geography also created a narrow corridor through which Argentine aircraft could attack at extremely low level. This stretch of water soon earned a name among British sailors, Bomb Alley. The survival of the landings depended almost entirely on the Sea Harrier's ability to hold the airspace above the anchorage. From dawn on the 21st, Argentine Skyhawks, Daggers, and Mirages launched continuous waves of sorties. Flying at treetop height to avoid radar, they appeared suddenly over ridgelines and descended directly onto the British ships unloading at the beachheads. The Sea Harriers, launched from HMS Hermes and HMS Invincible, were tasked with intercepting these attacks before they reached the anchorage. The engagements were fast, chaotic, and fought at altitudes where the Harrier's agility gave it a crucial edge. Sea Harriers claimed multiple victories that day alone, knocking out daggers and skyhawks before they could release their ordnance. Yet the Argentine pilots persisted with remarkable bravery, pressing home attacks in the face of mounting losses. Several British ships were hit, HMS Ardent, HMS Antelope and HMS Coventry would be lost over the following days, but without the Sea Harriers, the casualties would have been catastrophic. Their presence forced Argentine pilots into rushed, low-altitude attack runs that frequently led to bombs failing to fuse or missing their targets entirely. Beyond San Carlos, Harriers also played a vital role in shaping the broader tactical situation. At Goose Green, their close air support missions helped suppress Argentine positions, working in coordination with ground forces advancing across open terrain. Although weather frequently limited operations, the aircraft provided reconnaissance, interdiction, and rapid response capability that the land forces relied upon throughout the campaign. One of the most strategically significant actions occurred at Pebble Island on May 15, days before the landings. There, Sea Harriers escorted an SAS raid that destroyed 11 Argentine aircraft on the ground, including Pucaras, Mentors, and T-34 Turbo Mentors. The loss of these aircraft reduced the threat to British infantry and prevented future harassing attacks on the task force. By the end of May, the cumulative effect of constant air patrols, interception missions, and targeted strikes had worn down Argentina's combat strength. The Sea Harriers were no longer simply defending the fleet, they were steadily dismantling Argentina's ability to wage an air campaign at all. By early June, the cumulative impact of the Sea Harrier's performance was unmistakable. Argentina's air force, once seen as the overwhelming advantage in the conflict, was now fighting with depleted numbers, exhausted crews, and dwindling operational aircraft. Many losses had not occurred over the British fleet, but earlier in the campaign over Pebble Island, Darwin, Goose Green, and on repeated low-level runs against San Carlos. Each failed attack, each aborted mission, and each aircraft shot down eroded the Argentine ability to sustain pressure on the task force. The kill ratio achieved by the Sea Harriers stunned military planners around the world. Across the conflict, British pilots achieved more than 20 verified air-to-air -air kills without losing a single Sea Harrier in air combat. The aircraft Britain had once struggled to justify, dismissed internationally as underpowered and technologically modest, had outperformed supersonic fighters in one of the harshest operational environments imaginable. Analysts soon recognized that this success was not an accident of circumstance, but the result of a coherent system. Vectored thrust agility, reliable radar, disciplined tactics, and the game-changing AIM-9L, the Falklands War also demonstrated the strategic value of VE stole aviation. With no access to large carriers and no nearby bases, Britain still maintained a functional, resilient air defense network built around two small carriers and less than 30 sea harriers. Their ability to launch quickly, operate from compact decks, and remain on station for long periods gave the Royal Navy a degree of flexibility few had appreciated before the war. For NATO, this raised a profound question. 
If a subsonic V Stoll fighter could dominate against faster opponents in the South Atlantic, what might similar aircraft offer in Europe's constrained, dispersed, and missile-threatened environments? By the time Argentine forces surrendered on June 14, 1982, the verdict was clear. The aircraft mocked as outdated had proved decisive. In the cold skies over the Falklands, Britain's Harriers did more than protect a fleet, they rewrote modern air warfare's assumptions. And when the conflict ended, there was no doubt left anywhere in the world. Speed alone no longer defined air superiority.